Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, an episode on Israeli political parties. So today's episode was requested by CH on YouTube. If you want to request another country's political parties, you can either comment it down below, send me an email, or put a request in the request form in the description. I currently have requests to do Irish parties, Polish parties, Japanese parties, Turkish parties, Danish parties, Greek parties, Serbian parties, South Korean parties, Moroccan parties, Chilean parties, and many more. I would also like to thank Har L for helping me out with this episode. He's promised to help me out and look over the script, so big thank you to him, I appreciate it. Israel is holding an election on November 1st. This election is notable because it's the fifth election since 2019, with two elections in 2019, another one in 2020, another in 2021, and this one being the latest. Israeli elections are not supposed to happen this frequently, so what is going on? Well, the Knesset, the legislative body of Israel, has been unable to form a stable and long-term government since the first 2019 election, forcing Israeli voters to the polls and driving Israel into this political crisis. There are several reasons for this, a low electoral threshold, political polarization, and a refusal to compromise all have contributed to the crisis. However, one of the biggest problems is Israeli political parties are largely based around demographic groups, which are often inflexible and hold very combative positions towards certain other groups. Israeli parties often appeal less to the electorate as a whole, but more to a specific group. So with that being said, let's start talking briefly about the various different groups in Israeli society. So, important to note, Jews are not a monolithic group. There are many different Jewish ethnic groups. The largest Jewish communities primarily come from three different ethnic classifications. The Ashkenazi, who are Jews whose origins are primarily from Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. The Mizrahi, who are Jews whose origins are primarily from the Middle East and North Africa, and Sephardic Jews, who are Jews whose origins primarily come from Spain and Portugal. Ashkenazi Jews historically dominated the country after independence and tended to support more left-wing parties. Mizrahi slash Sephardic Jews since the 70s have seen increased political power and often tend to vote right. As many of you probably know, Israel has a very large Palestinian slash Arab population within its borders. Just because we are talking about Israeli political parties, which by its nature is dominated by the Jewish population of the state, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time discussing the various identities or labels among the Palestinians slash Arabs within Israel. I will just briefly say that what term you use to describe this population is very debated and politicized. I'm going to use Israeli Arabs since it identifies that they are citizens of Israel and can vote and participate in Israeli elections. However, I will also note that most Israeli Arabs do define themselves as just Palestinian. So Jews, besides having various ethnic distinctions, also have different religious distinctions. There are secular Jews, Reform Judaism, and Conservative Judaism. There's also Orthodox Jews, who are considered more conservative than the previous three. And then finally, there is the Ultra-Orthodox, or Haredi. The Haredi are probably one of the most controversial groups within Israeli society, because they often are very insular, Many of their political leaders tend to push for a more religious Israel, and have a lot of very specific rules and exemptions for them. So, for example, they don't have to serve in the IDF or Israeli Defense Forces. Many secular Jews see the Haredi as infringing on them and taking advantage of the system, while the Haredi argue that more secular Jews are trying to assimilate and destroy their communities. I think it's been enough time talking about the various denominations for you to get a general picture of the various different groups in Israel, and also for people to get mad at me and start writing hate mail, so we'll move on to the political structure of Israel. As mentioned earlier, the main legislative body of Israel is the Knesset. There are 120 members of the Knesset, or MKs, who are all elected via proportional representation. If any party gets over 3.25% of the vote, so no need to get any sort of geographic representation, they will get at least some seats in the Knesset. The Knesset will vote on rules and regulations, elect the prime minister, the most powerful political figure in the country, and their cabinet, along with the president of the country. Also to note, Israel does not have a written constitution. And then finally, before we begin, I just want to briefly mention that a good chunk of my information comes from the YouTube channel, Elections Israel. They've done several videos talking about Israeli political parties, and there's a very high chance they will do their own video on Israeli parties before this election as well. I say all this to encourage you to check them out if you're curious and want to learn more on Israeli politics, 
And also to say that while their videos on Israeli politics have helped in writing this episode, I won't be directly copying from them and will try to bring in some new information. So with that out of the way, let's start talking about the various parties of Israel. We'll start off with the largest party, Likud, or the Consolidation. Likud, since 1977, has been one of the most powerful and dominant parties in the country, winning most elections and coming out on top. It's considered right-wing and conservative, being formed from a collection of right-wing and revisionist Zionist parties. It is the party of Israeli Prime Minister from 1996 to 1999 and 2009 to 2021, and current Likud leader, Benjamin Netanyahu and to a certain extent has evolved in recent years to largely become a party by and for Netanyahu's supporters. It tends to be backed by Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, particularly those who are working class or in urban areas. It also does have a decent number of Israeli Arab supporters, when compared to other Jewish-dominated parties, owing largely to Netanyahu's name recognition and his attempts to attract Israeli Arab support in recent elections. It currently has 29 MKs. Netanyahu, besides being party leader, is also an MK and is the leader of the opposition. Likud and Netanyahu are considered right on economics, domestic issues, and security policy. It supports more privatization and deregulation, supports a free market or mixed economy, wants to reduce the bureaucracy, and seeks to reduce spending overall. Likud tends to argue for a more militarily powerful Israeli state, wanting to take an aggressive approach towards Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas, supporting a strong IDF and police force, opposes a Palestinian state, although Netanyahu has argued a weak Palestinian state would be supported by him, and favors Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Socially, it tends to favor the status quo, although due to the fact that it is allied with several Haredi parties, it partially is supportive of measures to emphasize the Jewish nature of the Israeli state. Netanyahu has tended to back and support right-wing populists slash national conservatives in other countries, such as Trump or Orban. It also, on his website, brags about giving free education to all children over three, free dental treatment for children over 12, and the construction of thousands of housing units to reduce the cost of rent. Netanyahu is probably the Israeli politician with the most name recognition, partially because he's been the prime minister for such a long time, but also partially because he is a quite controversial politician, and using his position as prime minister to give shady deals to businessmen, and of having worked with the mafia. This charge has been very divisive, with Netanyahu supporters claiming the charges are just a witch hunt, while those hostile towards Netanyahu tend to paint him as the most corrupt man in the world. Netanyahu's hardline approach towards the Palestinians has led to a lot of accusations, ranging from Netanyahu simply being a bit antagonistic and distrustful towards the Palestinians slash Arabs, to being outright racist and discriminatory, to being a war criminal. The fact that Netanyahu has historically allied with very religious and or hard right parties has also been controversial. I'm focusing a lot on Netanyahu because there's a sense that Likud has shifted from a party representing right-wing Zionists to just a party that will support and back whatever Netanyahu says and does. There's a fear that if Netanyahu were to leave politics, Likud may collapse due to infighting and power struggles, and so Likud supporters are partially forced to continue to back Netanyahu no matter what. We go from rapidly pro-Netanyahu to rapidly anti-Netanyahu, with Yeshatid, or There is a Future. Yeshatid was founded back in 2012 by current party leader, and also current prime minister, Yar Lapid, and his supporters. Yeshatid was formed as a liberal Zionist party, occupying the center of Israeli politics. However, as the Israeli left has crumbled, Yeshatid has sort of become the new major left-wing party, although they haven't really moved left. After breaking off of the Blue and White Coalition, which I will discuss more in just a second, and contesting the 2021 election, it became the largest anti-Netanyahu party, and the largest party in the current outgoing government. It tends to get support from middle to upper middle class Israelis, those found in Tel Aviv or the surrounding areas, and among secular Jews. It currently has 17 MKs. Lapid, besides being party leader and prime minister, is also an MK, Minister of Foreign Affairs, was the son of a former government minister and a TV personality before entering politics. Yeshatid origins as a centrist party means it doesn't dogmatically lean in any direction. It favors the mixed economy, talks about wanting to reduce gaps in Israeli society on the website, doesn't really dive any deeper, and does favor a two-state solution and a halt to Israeli settlements, but also favors annexing the Golan Heights, does call to preserve the Jewish identity of Israel, and Lapid called the BDS movement anti-Semitic. Yeshatid has really made a name for itself embracing secularism and opposing attempts by the ultra-Orthodox that Yeshatid sees as imposing their beliefs on them. It favors same-sex marriage, believes Haredi men should be drafted into the IDF, wants to fund non-Orthodox Jewish denominations, and supports public transport on Saturdays. 
It also is strongly anti-corruption, favors equality under the law for all, wants to strengthen the courts, wants to reduce unemployment, and wants more funds to go towards soldiers and the elderly. Yeshati, despite criticizing the cult of personality around Netanyahu, has also similarly been accused of holding a cult of personality around its leader, Lapid. Since Lapid is the son of a former high-ranking politician, there's a sense that he never had to work as hard as others to get into political office, and is just a trust fund baby, similar to Justin Trudeau in Canada. Yeshati's support base of the middle-slash-upper class also likely means they are viewed to a certain extent as elitist, and a party just for those who are well-off in Israel. Finally, Yeshatid's strongly pro-secular stance has led the Haredi to accuse the party of trying to destroy their way of life and impose secular morals on them. Hamanahe Hamalakti, or the National Unity Party, is a recently formed coalition of two separate parties, the Israeli Resilience Party and New Hope. The Israeli Resilience Party, a social liberal party, along with Yeshatid and a small liberal party, Talem, formed the Blue and White Coalition in 2019. This coalition lasted until after the 2020 election, when the Israeli Resilience Party decided to form a unity government with Likud, resulting in the Resilience Party being the only party left in blue and white as the rest abandoned them. New Hope was formed in 2020 as a breakoff of Likud, opposing corruption in the party. This new National Unity Party is, like Yeshati, broadly liberal and centrist, but also allied with the Israeli left and a part of the current government. It currently has 15 MKs. The coalition is led by blue and white leader Benny Gantz, a former IDF general and current Minister of Defense and MK. New Hope itself is led by Gidon Saar, an MK and Minister of Justice. The National Unity Party's goal is to create a unity government after the election, seeing that polls are suggesting yet another hung parliament. Since the parties are part of the anti-Netanyahu bloc, they both strongly oppose corruption. They also both favor a strong IDF. However, they also are fairly different. Resilience, for example, backs a two-state solution, albeit one with many preconditions, while New Hope is opposed to such, seeing it as unrealistic. Resilience also opposes racism in Israel, and wants to expand the draft to the Haredi and Israeli Arab populations. New Hope, meanwhile, backs term limits, a move to a mixed-member proportional electoral system, and fighting for a free economy. The National Unity Party is very firm in opposing Netanyahu, but besides that, it seems like their message is muddled. Several articles have pointed out the problems with merging two parties together for a single list, and have pointed out that similar to Likud and Yeshatid, there is a partial cult of personality around Gantz. This is particularly awkward since Gantz isn't that charismatic. Gantz deciding to side with Likud after the 2020 election also has partially led to some criticism of the party. Finally, I'd say that while New Hope has its party elites embracing right-wing positions, it seems the average New Hope voter is much more left-leaning, and supports the party less because they actually like it and its principles, and more because they like what it theoretically represents, a conservative party that challenges Netanyahu, and believes that voting for it will weaken Netanyahu. If that will happen, seems to be unclear. Next we go to Shas. Shas is a party largely based around representing Mizrahi and Sephardic Haredi, and was founded in order to ensure their representation in government. It is broadly defined as Zionist and made up of Jewish conservatives. Its support base is unsurprisingly largely based around this Mizrahi and Sephardic Haredi community, particularly the men from this community, and uniquely has no women candidates on its electoral list ever. However, it also tends to preach very populist, almost anti-Western, anti-elitist sentiments, which does give it a small amount of support from some members of the urban working class and among some Israeli Arabs. It, since 2015, has served as a reliable ally to Netanyahu's Likud. It currently has nine MKs. It is currently headed by Arye Deri, a former MK, Minister of the Interior, and Minister of the Development of Negev and Galilee. Shas's main goal is to protect the Haredi from being assimilated and ensure they are respected. They want to fight for Jewish religious laws to become the law of the land, supports more welfare to go towards the Haredi community, opposes the draft being extended towards them, and overall wants to see the Haredi community expand and thrive. However, it also focuses on improving the welfare of Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews, wanting more welfare to go towards their community, believes the government should financially compensate Mizrahi Jews who fled their homes, and wants to fight discrimination against this group. It also is strongly opposed to gay marriage, pride parades, and opposes freezes on Israeli settlements. Since Shas is a party mostly by and for the Haredi, secular Israelis tend to view the group as imposing Haredi customs onto them. The reason this government crisis began in 2019 was because Israel Batenu, a party we will get to later, refused to work with the Haredi parties since they felt they were too pushy and held too much control in Netanyahu's coalition. 
Because the Haredi parties are very religious and traditional, they have no female candidates, which has also led to accusations that the party is ignoring issues affecting females, and is the party just for men. After some Haredi women began to protest this in 2014, senior figures in Shas threatened to remove and blacklist these women from the wider Haredi community. Finally, Shas has been seen as a party suffering from a lot of corruption, with Deri being convicted of corruption twice, several other Shas politicians being accused of corruption, and Shas being fined for handing out cards that promised to protect people from COVID. The next party formerly was a powerhouse in Israeli politics, but is now struggling to hold on. Miga Left, Havoda, Ha Israelit, or the Israeli Labor Party, is a social democratic and left-wing Zionist party. It and its ideological predecessors dominated Israeli politics from independence until 1977. But even after 1977, it still was quite powerful, and was able to form a government at several points. However, after 2019, they have dramatically fallen out of public favor, for reasons I'll talk about later on. It historically got most support among the urban working class. However, this has become less and less true over the years. Today, it seems the Labour Party is mostly backed by younger, primarily Ashkenazi Israelis, especially those found in the government bureaucracy or as young officers in the IDF. Being the traditional rivals to Likud, it is hostile towards it and serves as a part of the outgoing government. It currently has seven MKs. It is headed by Mirav Mihaleli, an MK and Minister of Transport. The current president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, is also a member of the Labour Party. Labour backs center-left economic policy, liberal social policy, and tends to be more sympathetic towards the peace camp. It opposes further privatization, wants to raise the minimum wage, is sympathetic towards unions, and backs a mixed or social market economy. It is progressive socially, opposing discrimination, favors further LGBTQ rights, supports paid maternity leave, wants to increase the number of women in politics, and opposes implementing Jewish religious laws. It favors a two-state solution, although they also are in favor of a strong IDF. It also is pro-American and friendly with the Democratic Party, favors the legalization of cannabis, and supports a strong welfare state. Labor's fall from grace really started in the early 2000s, after the Second Intifada. Right-wing Israelis began accusing the party of being too soft towards the Palestinians, and there was a sense that the party has become out of touch with the average Israeli. However, more left-wing Israelis felt the party moved away from its more left-wing positions and accused it of selling out. Overall, the party that once dominated Israel became more and more associated with elitism and was considered almost a relic of a bygone era. The party has suffered from infighting as different factions in the party fought for influence, and the party has really failed to get a popular or successful leader who can both unite the party and appeal to the Israeli electorate. Right now, it seems the infighting has finally gone away. However, this was largely at the cost of large segments of its electorate abandoning the party. The party likely isn't going to entirely disappear from Israeli politics anytime soon, but right now, it's doubtful they will return to become a dominant player. While Shas is the party for Mizrahi and Sephardic Haredi, Ashkenazi Haredi find their home in Yahadut HaTorah, or United Torah Judaism, or UTJ. UTJ is a coalition of two parties that are broadly defined as right-wing and made up of Jewish conservatives. While Shas appeals just barely to groups outside the Haredi community, UTJ is entirely supported by Ashkenazi Haredi and really no one else. The UTJ coalition is, as stated previously, made up of two parties, one that appeals to Lithuanian Haredi, and another that appeals to Hasidic Jews, which, based off my understanding, is a certain branch of ultra-Orthodox Judaism. It got a lot of support in and around Jerusalem last election. It currently has seven MKs. It is led by Moshe Gafni, an MK. While Shas is focused on issues around the Haredi and improving the economic conditions of Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, UTJ is largely just focused on the first part. Like Shas, it wants to fight for Jewish religious laws to become the law of the land, supports more welfare to go towards the Haredi community, opposes the draft being extended towards them, and is very opposed to gay marriage. You can sometimes see it defined as non-Zionist, however this doesn't really seem to affect its policies from what I have seen. It also is very friendly towards Netanyahu and will likely form a government with him if he gets a majority. UTJ's policies are similar to Shas. So it's not surprising many of its criticisms are also similar. It's seen as imposing its will on the rest of Israeli society, it's seen as being dismissive towards women, and is accused of corruption. Uniquely, because it is a coalition, there is more infighting in UTJ than Shas. This infighting can range from how many seats each party will get, to religious and ideological arguments between the two, to who the party will ally with, although these days it is firmly in the pro Netanyahu camp. It also simply by the fact that it appeals to just the Haredi, is smaller and therefore weaker than Shas. From very religious to very secular, we go now to Yisrael Batenu, 
or Israel or home. Yisrael Betenu's support base comes from Eastern European Jews, who came to the country in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union. This group supports broadly right-wing policies, but they also support a two-state solution, which is uncommon for right-wing Israelis, and are very secular. They, along with getting support from recent Russian and Eastern European immigrants, also are supported by the Druze, and some secular Jews. It, as stated earlier, was partially responsible for the political crisis, and currently sits with the outgoing government. It has seven MKs. It is headed by Avigor Lieberman, an MK and Minister of Finance. Yisrael Betenu is right-wing on economics, favors a strong defense force, while also very opposed to Jewish religious laws becoming the law of the land. It supports a free market economy, heavy foreign investment in the economy, and wants to decrease bureaucracy in the country while also ensuring health care and welfare for all Israelis. It favors a strong IDF, favors increased spending and benefits to those who serve in the IDF, police force or fire department, wants to ban the Balad party, and favors a two-state solution where Israel and Palestine will exchange land for peace, with areas of Israel that are majority Arab being given to the Palestinians, while Israeli settlements will be absorbed into Israel proper. Its secularism largely comes from its origins as a party for Eastern European immigrants, who grew up in very secular communist states. It supports expanding the draft to Haredi men, opposes public transport being closed on Saturday, and wants to reduce the influence of the Haredi rabbis. It also supports more funds towards the Druze community, increased pension for pensioners, and supports tax credits for new immigrants. Yisrael Betenu, as stated earlier, was partially responsible for the current political crisis, with it refusing to work with the Haredi parties. This has put them in a weird position of being a right-wing party, but also forced to work with liberal and left-wing parties. While Yisrael Betenu can agree with them on promoting secularism, its more right-wing positions on security and economics makes the current government a bit awkward. It's possible if the party continues to work with parties that are so different from them, the party's support base may eventually abandon them. They also have been accused of corruption, being racist towards Arabs, and being made up of Putin apologists since Lieberman has been friendly with Putin's government. Speaking of Lieberman, there's two really crazy controversies associated with him, which I thought I'd just briefly mention. So back in 1999, Lieberman hit a 12-year-old after said 12-year-old bullied his kid. This he 100% admitted to, and still has remained a very important politician in Israel, which is kind of crazy. And then more recently, an Israeli man claimed Lieberman offered him $1,000 to assassinate a police chief. This he has refuted, claiming it is a smear campaign set up by Netanyahu. The next party is another party that also regularly finds itself in controversy. Hatzio Nutadeit, or Religious Zionist Party, is a hard-right party embracing right-wing populism, nationalism, and, as the name would suggest, religious Zionist policies. It has tended to work with other parties' right of Likud, hoping to push more nationalistic and right-wing policies. It, since 2013, has served as an ally to Likud, and Netanyahu has actually helped facilitate an alliance between it and two other parties, Noam, a party opposed to gay rights in Israel, and Otzmaya Hudit, a party that embraces an ideology known as Kahanism, which I'll explain a bit later on, but just know it's very right-wing. It tends to get most support among either Orthodox Jews or those in settlements, and to a lesser extent among British and American Jews. It currently has seven MKs. It is currently led by Bezalel Smoltrich, an MK and former Minister of Transport. The Religious Zionist Party's goal is to strengthen Israel's Jewish identity. To that end, they lean right on economics, domestic policy, and security policy. They want to annex large parts of the West Bank, with some members arguing the entire West Bank should be annexed, opposes freezes on Israeli settlements, opposes working with the Palestinian Authority, and favors a strong IDF. It is very opposed to gay marriage, wanting to protect the traditional Jewish family, and wants more funds to go towards religious schools. It also talks about wanting to increase funds towards the agricultural sector, make it easier for immigrants to assimilate within Israel, and talks of repairing the legal system. However, its website's English version is notably quite vague on this. Since the Religious Zionist Party is the most right-wing party running that has a shot at making it into the Knesset, it's not a huge surprise that a lot of people from the more liberal and left-wing sectors of Israeli society don't like them. They are accused of racism against the Arabs, and being made up of Jewish supremacists, and also of being useful idiots for Netanyahu. The two parties it is working with also are quite controversial, with Noam's opposition towards LGBTQ rights being viewed as homophobic. However, Otsmaya Yudit is probably the most controversial group within religious Zionism, since it's a Kahanist party. Kahanism, put succinctly, is an ideology that argues Israel should become an almost theocratic Jewish state, where non-Jews are given second-class status. Several terror attacks have been associated with Kahanism, most infamously the Cave of the Patriarchs Massacre. 
All of this has made the party very disliked outside its support base. And there's a lot of bad press in the media, but also its very unapologetic message has attracted certain segments of the Israeli right, and it looked set to become the third or fourth largest party after the election. Part of the religious Zionist party's success will likely come from the collapse of Yamina, or rightwards. Yamina was, slash is, a political alliance of several right-wing Zionist parties, largely led by Naftali Bennett and Ayala Sheked. Yamina has largely advocated for a tougher policy towards terrorism, supports neoliberal economics, and a lot of other broadly right-wing policies. While Bennett had previously allied with Likud, it also tended to criticize Netanyahu a lot, and starting in 2020, he and his allies served as opposition towards Likud. After the 2021 election, Yamina joined forces with the left-wing and liberal opposition in removing Netanyahu from power. Under the new government, Bennett was prime minister from June 2021 to June 2022, giving up the prime ministership to Lapid, and then reverting to Minister of Community Affairs. This move to ally with the liberal and left-wing opposition severely hurt the party. Many members of the party outright opposed it, and defections quickly began. For the upcoming election, it has attempted to rebrand itself as First Zionist Spirit, working with a breakoff of Blue and White. However, this collapsed a couple days ago, and now a rump faction is contesting the election as the Jewish home. There are roughly six MKs in this party slash grouping. Shaked is leading the Jewish home and is currently an MK and Minister of the Interior. Jewish home right now, according to opinion polls, looks unlikely to get into the Knesset, seeing as they are polling around 2% of the vote. Working with a coalition of parties that are opposed to many of your party's policies, unsurprisingly, has resulted in a lot of its party members feeling like the party sold out. Bennett has been criticized since roughly 2020 for essentially just saying anything Leku did was bad because Leku did it, and not really holding a consistent stance. While Shaked is attempting to lead the remaining supporters of the party, it will 100% be punished. Yamina's downfall really helps illustrate the gridlock present in Israeli politics, and why it's been so difficult for a government to form. There just isn't a working majority in Israeli politics. There are too many parties that cannot work with other parties unless they want to risk losing their support base. Next we go to Meretz, or Vigor. Meretz is seen as almost a close cousin to the Labour Party, representing progressives and democratic socialists who feel Labour isn't principled enough. It has existed since the 90s, often pushing for an unconditional peace deal with the Palestinians. While it has entered government at several points, including in the outgoing government, it was historically seen as a protest vote to labor. It today tends to be supported more among cultural figures, the intelligentsia, and to a certain extent among the more rural population. While it is primarily supported by Jews, particularly Ashkenazi Jews, it does get some support among Israeli Arabs. It currently has six MKs. It is headed by Zehu Galan, a former MK. Meretz's policies tend to line up with labor's policies, they support a two-state solution, support a strong welfare state, oppose further privatization, support further LGBTQ rights, and support secularism. However, they tend to differ with labor in the intensity of their demands, arguing that a two-state solution should be reached unconditionally, refuses to compromise on most of its policy positions, and opposes working with Haredi parties so long as they continue to insist on pushing for religious laws in Israel. They also support further environmental regulations. Meretz is seen as a more hardcore labor party, which means if you think labor is bad, too naive on the Palestinians, or too left-wing, then there's a very strong chance you also think Meretz is bad as well. At the same time labor started to enter into a decline, Meretz shortly followed them, with Meretz failing to get even 5% of the vote at any point since 2003. Meretz, of course, being just slightly left of labor, often leads to bitter infighting between them and labor. Labor supporters will see them as unrealistic, inexperienced, and of being a party that splits the center-left slash left-wing vote. Merit supporters will likely disagree with this and throw their own accusations back at labor, but it is true that the Israeli left is quite weak at this point in history. The Israeli left has been forced to work with centrists like Yashatid and right-wing parties like Yamina. While this can be justified as a temporary alliance to stop Netanyahu, long-term, if the Israeli left continues to serve as junior partners to larger ideological blocs, they risk further infighting, further loss in elections, and further accusations that they are irrelevant. The last couple parties we will talk about are all parties that formally made up a coalition known as the Joint List, that bases its support around the Arab citizens of Israel. The Joint List, at least for this election, is going to be dissolved. The largest rump faction is going to be alliance between the Hadash, or New Party, and the Arab Movement for Renewal, 
or by its acronym, the Tall Party. Hadash is a communist party, being the furthest left party present in the Knesset. It, while never being particularly powerful, has always had some influence in Israel. Notably, it's the only ex journalist party that has some Jewish support. Although it's fairly marginal, and its Jewish members are often criticized for being token Jews. Tall, on the other hand, isn't as Marxist-inspired, largely basing its policy on opposing racism against Israeli Arabs. It currently has five MKs. Hadash is led by Ayman O'Day, while Tal is led by Ahmed Taibi, both MKs. The hadash Tal alliance argues primarily for a two-state solution and an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It wants a Palestinian state to be on equal footing with Israel, opposes the blockade in Gaza, and wants to dismantle Israeli settlements. They are strongly opposed to discrimination against Israeli Arabs, with Hadash calling for the recognition of Israeli Arabs as a national minority and calling for the repeal of racist and what it considers apartheid-style laws. They also support a minimum wage, increased child allowances, opposing any attempts at privatization, and supports free healthcare and education. Out of all the Arab parties, Hadash is the most mainstream, but it, like pretty much all Arab parties, are looked at with suspicion. Right-wing, and even a good chunk of centrist and left-wing Israelis, frequently criticize the Arab parties for being traitors and or sympathetic to Palestinian terrorist organizations, and will point to stuff like O'Day calling Arabs who serve in the IDF as a humiliation, or Hadash's condemnation of Gulf states labeling Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. This has led to several attempts being made to outright ban the Arab parties or individual politicians. And while right now most attempts have been unsuccessful, it is possible that in the future the party may be outright banned. But while a decent number of Jews call them traitors and refuse to work with them, Israeli Arabs and Palestinians sometimes criticize the party for even operating within the Israeli state, arguing that operating in the Knesset legitimizes it. Finally, while Hadash and the other Arab parties we will talk about have distinct ideologies, Tal seems to just be there. It's never run independently, and seems to mostly take a backseat to the more relevant and powerful Hadash. The Arab parties, while under the joint list, never entered into government, since no parties really wanted to work with them, since they were considered too radical and or inflexible. One party, though, managed to break this trend. The United Arab List, or Ra'am, broke off from the joint list last election and joined the current outgoing government. Ra'am is considered the political wing of the Islamic movement of Israel, specifically its southern faction. It doesn't seem to advocate for Israel to become a full-on Islamic state, but it is supportive of Israel becoming a greater feature in everyday life for Israeli Arabs. It primarily gets the most support in the Negev region among the rural Bedouin population, and also among the more religiously devout Muslims. It currently has four MKs. It is headed by Mansour Abbas, an MK. Since getting into government, Ra'am has sought to get the Israeli government to recognize and support the Bedouin population of the country. It has sought to increase funds going into Arab towns, hoping to improve infrastructure, education, healthcare, and security, and wants to recognize Bedouin settlements to give them greater legal protection. Its association with the Islamic movement also means it is more conservative socially, opposing gay marriage or further LGBTQ rights. It also supports a two-state solution. Ram's, quite frankly, strange position in Israeli politics has created a lot of problems for the group. The Arab parties are much more left-wing than Ram, so it's always been a bit of the odd man out. And since it is now working in a government with right-wing parties like Yamina, it is seen as having sold out in order to gain political power. Abbas also saying that Israel is a Jewish state also created controversy among Arab voters. Meanwhile, more secular voters are skeptical of the party's more religious and conservative streak, seeing them as attempting to push more Islamic morals on the country. Some news outlets have actually suggested Ram may find allies with the Haredi parties and Likud, since they are more socially conservative. However, Likud and Netanyahu are skeptical of the party's ties with the Islamic movement. The Islamic movement after 1996 split into a north and south wing, with the northern wing eventually being banned in 2015 for holding ties to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. While the southern branch isn't organizationally tied to the northern branch, their origins have attracted a lot of criticism towards the party. The last party we will talk about is the National Democratic Rally, or Balad. Balad broke up from Hadash and Tal very recently, and will contest elections on its own. It is very devoutly anti-Zionist. It does support a two-state solution, but argues that Israel needs to remove its racist laws, become a bi-national state, allows Palestinians the right of return, and gives self-determination to the Palestinians. It also supports broadly center-left economics, secularism, and more funds to go towards Arab towns. The party among the ex-jointless parties is seen as the most inflexible and radical, 
refusing to work with other non-Arab parties, and is sometimes considered more of a protest party than anything else. Balad also has been controversial for establishing ties between it and Hezbollah, its founder being forced to flee the country due to espionage charges, and for refusing to be seen with Jewish MKs outside the Knesset. Balad right now is polling around 2% of the vote, so unless Israeli Arab turnout is surprisingly high, which most analysts are predicting it won't be, there's a very good chance that Balad will fail to win any seats. It right now has one MK who is also its party leader, Sami Abu Shahad. So those are the parties of Israel. There's a lot of very unique parties that don't really have an equivalent anywhere else, but broadly there's Likud, the main party of the center-right on paper, Yesh Atid, a secular middle-class party, National Unity, a centrist coalition, Shas and UTJ, two Haredi groupings, Labor and Meretz, who make up the center-left of Israel, Yisrael Batenu, a party for Russian Jews, Religious Zionist Party, a hard-right party, Yamina, a right-wing anti-Nanyahu party, and then Hadash, Tal, Ra'am, and Balad, who are all Arab parties. What will happen after this election is a little unclear. It's very possible another election will have to occur before a stable government can be formed, so you can prepare yourself for potentially even more Israeli election news. Although right now, opinion polls are actually showing that Netanyahu may just be able to eke out a win. But yeah, thanks for listening, thanks for watching. Hopefully, my pronunciations of Hebrew and Arabic were not completely 100% terrible. Hopefully they were just a moderate, acceptable level of terribleness. But yeah, hope you enjoyed. Hope hope you liked it. Uh, thanks again to Harel for helping me out. I really appreciate it. So after this, I will work on Irish political parties. I'm not sure when that'll be out, but hopefully like within a week of this coming out, that should be out. Then I will talk about the history of Canada. That will be probably a longer video, so that might take a little bit of time. And then I will talk about Polish political parties. I know someone on YouTube has been commenting, saying that they would love to help me out with that one. Um, I would love to get your help. Just email me. Uh, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for if you want to help me out with a future video or if you want to send hate mail. So yeah, thank you. Take care. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.